worked. And so this morning, Romans 8, I'm going to read the first 17 verses, and then we're going to begin a new series. Basically, what we want to look at is how do we grow in our faith? This is probably the number one question that I have been asked over the last six months from you guys is, am I growing? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? How do I know um, that I'm growing in my walk with Jesus? And so how do I grow in my walk with Jesus? And so over the next several weeks, we're going to just be looking at this topic. It's going to be different from our normal um, series. Normally, we will go through books of the Bible, and we will just go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and study. But this one's going to be a little bit more topical. It's going to be, we're going to be flipping the Bible um, different places, and we're going to be studying together. Um, and, but we're going to be looking at how do we grow in our walk with Jesus. And this morning's message is the foundation for every other um, sermon that you're about to hear. If you don't get this part, you're going to miss everything else. And so, um, so would you be praying that God would open your heart to receive um, the word this morning? And so Romans 8, verses 1 through 17. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering, in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on the things of the spirit. Now the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. The mind set on the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it's unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. But now if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we're not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, but if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all those who are led by God's spirits by God's spirit, our God's son. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that also we may be glorified with him. I'm going to begin this morning by telling you a story of a young lady by the name of Lola. The story is taken out of a really powerful article that was written in The Atlantic just last year. Lola grew up in a poor family in the rural parts of the Philippines. She was penniless, unschooled, and very gullible. Her parents wanted her to marry a local pig farmer that was twice her age but she was incredibly unhappy with that prospect. And one day, an army lieutenant approached her with an offer that she couldn't resist. He told her that, I will give you food, and I will give you shelter, and I'll take care of you if you would just commit to taking care of my daughter. Lola agreed, but she had no idea that she had just signed up to be a slave for the rest of her life. Lola lived with that daughter and eventually her children and her grandchildren. For 56 years, both in the Philippines and here in America, she raised children. She cooked and cleaned from dawn till dark. She was tongue-lashed. She was beaten. She wore used clothing. She ate scraps that were on the floor that were leftovers all by herself. She slept anywhere that she could find a spot to sleep on, on couches, in storage areas, in corners, on piles of laundry. And as Alex, the son of the family that enslaved Lola, grew up, he began to understand that Lola was a slave, that she wasn't really part of the family. And as a young adult, he began to pour into her. He gave her an ATM that was linked to his bank account and said, and he, you can use it for what you need. He 
He tried to teach her how to drive, teach her how to speak and write, and all sorts of different things to invest in her. Later, he invited Lola to come live with him. He gave her a bedroom, gave her permission to do whatever she wanted. Sleep in, he said. Watch TV. Or if you want, do nothing at all. You can just chill. She could relax and be free for the first time in her life. He sat her down and he said, this is your house. You're not here no longer to serve us. You can now rest. You're part of our family. Okay, she said. But she went back to cleaning. She went back to cooking. Because Lola had no idea how not to be a slave. One day, Alex came home and found Lola sitting on the couch with her feet up, doing a word puzzle and watching TV with a cup of tea beside her. And she looked up sheepishly. Progress, he thought. Lola had been a slave for so long that she struggled to embrace freedom when it was offered to her. She spent the last years of her life with only a fleeting understanding that she was free and that she was loved. I say that story to begin because in a very similar way, many of us find it incredibly difficult to accept our freedom that we have in Jesus. The Bible says that all of us, every one of us have sinned, have lived as slaves to sin. We're so used to it that we struggle to understand that in Jesus we are no longer slaves. And we'll spend the rest of our lives trying to live in light of two truths that, that we find incredibly difficult to grasp, that in Jesus we're free and in Jesus we're loved. Friends, that's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. We live in a time where we hear the word gospel talked about a lot. It's become a buzzword in churches, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Of the words that I would use to describe us as a church, when people ask, I say that we're a gospel-centered church. And my prayer is that for each of you, that you would be gospel-centered people. And if that is our end goal, then we have to ask the question, what is the gospel. What's the gospel? A Christian leader once argued that we should take the next 10 years to define the gospel. He was right and he was wrong. We do need to define the gospel. There's nothing more important than understanding at the deepest core of our being the truth of what God has done for us in Jesus. The gospel is, simpl is simple and yet it is complex. A small child can understand it, sometimes better than we can. But the most advanced theologian will never be able to understand the deepest truths of the fact that God would love you and I. And yet, we cannot wait 10 years to define the gospel. We need the gospel now. We no sooner can take 10 years to define the gospel than we can take a 10-year break from breathing. That's how essential the gospel is for our lives. The gospel is of first importance. We need it. Our churches need it. We need it if we have any hope of becoming what we're meant to be because the gospel is the key to growth. And as we talk about this series of growing, it is built on the foundation of the gospel. So what is the gospel? See, the gospel is set within the larger story of a good world that's gone bad because of the sin of humanity. Unless we understand the larger story, it's impossible to understand the gospel itself. The Bible tells one unified story that explains our world, and the centerpiece of that story is the gospel. God created everything good. He looked at creation and said, this is good, including you and I, but we rebelled against him. And we see evidence of the brokenness of this world all around us, in the wars, in violence, in injustice, inequality, relationship breakdowns, natural disasters, sicknesses, death, and so much more. The world is broken beyond our ability to fix it. Not only is the world is broken, but so are we. I'm broken. You're broken. We're a mess. We've contaminated the world through our three treason against a good and holy God. We made such a good mess of the world that God would have been justified in writing us off. He would be right to judge us and be done with us. But instead, God chooses to rescue us. 
God, one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit conspires together to save us. The Father sends His Son, Jesus, to become one of us. Instead of destroying the world, He enters the world. And when Jesus was born, He becomes the first person in history to live His entire life without rebelling against God. His obedience was perfect. And because His obedience was perfect, Jesus gives us a taste of the way life as it should be. He heals the sick. He served the outcast. He confronted injustice. The miracles that he performed foreshadowed the day when God would restore the world to the way that it is supposed to be. And yet that's not even the best part of the gospel because although Jesus was truly the first innocent person to ever live, he took our place and he died as payment for the sins that you and I committed. He repeatedly emphasized that this is why I came. He not only entered the world filled with people who deserve to be judged, but he took the judgment on himself so that you and I don't have to. And by doing this, he restores us to a relationship with the Father. And to everyone's surprise, the followers of Jesus find his grave empty three days after he's been killed. And before the ascension, 500 people see him alive. His resurrection proves that what he said was true. It vindicated him. It also shows us that you and I, we can trust him. And it gives a preview of what will happen to those who will follow him. See, one day Jesus will return and he'll judge all of us. And then he will completely renew the world. Those who have trusted in Jesus will enjoy the world as it was meant to be, to be in perfect relationship with the Father forever. But now, the gospel calls us to a response. God invites us to come to him and surrender, admitting our need of a Savior. God calls us to admit the truth about ourselves, to turn away from our sins, to follow him in faith and trust There's only one way to get ourselves out of the mess that we find ourselves in, and that's to put our trust in Jesus. You and I, without Jesus, we've been found guilty. But Jesus has already paid the penalty for those who put their faith in him and put their trust in him. See, if we cling to our own efforts to pay that penalty, we'll miss out on what Jesus has done, and we'll face the penalty ourselves, a penalty that we could never pay. We have to take advantage of the gospel. That is our only hope, brothers. That's our only hope, sisters. See, until Jesus comes back, my job and your job and our job as a church is to show and tell the world the story of the gospel. The gospel should motivate us. It should guide us. It should empower us. It calls us to a lifestyle of response, of repentance. Once we respond in genuine repentance and faith, the gospel begins to change everything about us. That's a lot. And yet it barely scratches the surface of what the gospel means. To simplify it a bit more, the gospel can be summarized in the following three truths. Number one, God is holy. Humanity is sinful. And God is rescuing his people and creation through the perfect work of Jesus. These three truths set everything right. They not only show us how to be right with God, but they show us how to live. The best news of all is that God's rescue is completely based on his grace. We don't earn any of it. We don't deserve it, but it's ours freely given to us by God. That's the best news ever. Paul, who used to be an enemy of Jesus, who once used to persecute the church, who became one of the most passionate followers of Jesus, he wrote that we stand in the gospel and we're being saved by the gospel. In 1 Corinthians, he says, For I delivered to you a first importance of what I received. What's most important? That Christ died for our sins. That he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. It's the very power of God, the greatest truth known by humanity. And yet, often we treat it like it doesn't matter. Often we completely ignore it. Often we 
base our spiritual life based on how well we perform or what we do and the things that we are actively doing. The Apostle Paul observed this tendency even in the first generation church. He writes to the Galatian church, he said, I'm astonished that you're deserting him who called you by the grace of God and you are now turning away to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, there's only one gospel. So what does all of this mean for us? Because the work of Jesus is the most climatic event of history and the transformative truth of our lives, we can look at it with every aspect of our lives. In fact, most of the New Testament, and we saw this in James, is spent unpacking of how we apply the gospel to every aspect of our lives. Simply open to any New Testament passage to discover an aspect of the gospel applied to your life. Even the passage we read this morning, Romans 8, is full of aspects of gospel being applied to our lives. This chapter has been called the greatest chapter in all of Scripture. It begins with the word, there's no condemnation. It ends with the words that there's no separation. And right in the middle of the passage are the words, there are no defeat. No condemnation, no separation, no defeat. The gospel is the only reason we could say that. Personally, I come to Romans 8 again and again, whenever I'm discouraged, whenever I'm facing challenges. I don't see how you can read Romans 8 and stay down. If you struggle with guilt, read Romans 8. If you struggle with sin, read Romans 8 over and over. If you don't know how to pray, read Romans 8. If you're struggling with the assurance of your salvation, Read Romans 8. And interestingly, Romans 8 is an exhortation, and yet there's not a single command in this chapter. It is reminding us of what God has done for us. It is full of implications of the gospel for our lives. And I just want to highlight just a few things, to, few things here in this passage. Number one, the implication of the gospel, number one, you are free from guilt and shame. All of us in this room are familiar with shame. The internal sense that we don't measure up or we failed someone, that we're not okay. It's an emotional weapon that Satan uses to corrupt our relationship with God and each other. And to disintegrate our vision and creativity. And all of us know what guilt is like. The objective sense that we haven't met this external standard. And even though widespread acceptance of religion is on the decline, we still all struggle with guilt, don't we? The gospel provides the remedy that we need. For those who trust in Jesus, every wrong that we've done and every good left undone, past, present, and future, has been dealt with at the cross of Jesus. Jesus has made full payment so that when God looks at us, he sees the perfect righteousness of God. The Bible offers this shocking declaration in verse 1 of Romans 8. He says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We're free from sin. We're free from guilt. We're free from shame. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is found in the Old Testament book of Zechariah. Zechariah, the prophet, has this vision of Joshua, the high priest, standing in front of God's presence. It was the Day of Atonement, which meant that Joshua had spent days preparing himself so that he could be pure before God. Yet in Zechariah's vision, Joshua stood before God in dirty clothes. The language that Zechariah uses says that Zach Joshua was full of excrement. He was just disgusting and smelly, and he was standing before God. And to make it worse, Satan was standing there accusing Joshua of all of his failures. What do you do when the enemy constantly reminds you of your failures and your shortcomings? What do you do when he tells you that you're not good enough to stand in the presence of God? What do you do when he tells you that you're not worthy enough to worship him? What do you do when you're not good enough that you will never be good enough? Friends, that's when you need the gospel. We're hopeless before God without it. Zachariah's vision, God looks at Satan and says, you know what, shut up. He took away Joshua's filthy clothes and he clothes him like royalty. 
And friends, that demonstrates to us what God does for each and every one of us when we come to Jesus. When you feel guilt, when you feel shame, when you feel regret, you can be reminded through Romans 8 that God has silenced your accuser. He has removed your guilt. He has reclothed you with righteousness. He has dealt decisively with your sin, not just with some of them, but with every single one of them. You don't have to live in guilt. Martin Luther, a priest who struggled with guilt for uh, more than 500 years ago, discovered the gospel's power in dealing with sin, and he offered this advice that still holds true today. He said, when the devil throws sin up to you and declares that you deserve death and hell, you ought to say this. You say, I, I admit I deserve death and hell. What of it? Does this mean that I should now be sentenced to eternal damnation? By no means. For I know the one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus, the Son of God. Where he is, I will be also. Listen, we should have that same assurance. The gospel removes every condemnation from your life. You will still encounter guilt and shame as long as you live, but you can keep turning to the gospel to remind you that in Jesus you are forgiven. In Jesus you are cleansed. In Jesus you are clothed with honor. Whenever you don't feel like you measure up, you can remind yourselves that God removes your shame because Jesus measures up. All of us that trust in Jesus also measure up. Number two, you are loved and you're accepted. Shea Glover was an 18-year-old high school student from Chicago, and she decided to conduct this social experiment at her school. She recorded videos of her classmate and she would take this video camera out and just start recording before and after reactions of before she explained her purpose. She'd take her video and start recording and walk up to a person, see their response. And then she would say, you know what? I'm just taking pictures of things that I find beautiful. And then all of a sudden, their expressions completely change. After being called beautiful, every face lit up with joy. We can't help but light up when we're appreciated. See, often we tend to think that God somehow just tolerates us. That God just kind of, he doesn't burn us down because he's got other things to worry about, but he's just tolerating us. But friends, that can't be possibly anywhere near the truth at all. The gospel corrects us by announcing that we did, even though we did nothing to deserve it, Listen, each of us are intimately loved and accepted by God. The prophet Zephaniah in the Old Testament again concludes this stern warning for the people of God. And then he, in the midst of his warning, he writes this truth in Zephaniah 2. He says, the Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exalt over you with singing. Did you hear that? God will exalt over you with singing. God will quiet you by his love. Isn't that staggering? God doesn't just tolerate you, but he rejoices over you. He exalts over us with singing. To exalt there means to express joy. It includes actions such as leaping and shouting and dancing. God isn't just reserved in his affection for his people. He overflows in his love for you. And friends, you can now approach God like a young son approaches his loving father. And hard things somehow seem easier when we know we're loved. Jesus himself in John 15 said, Greater love has no man than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus' work is both the foundation and the greatest evidence that God loves you. You can't mess it up. God doesn't just tolerate you. He lavishes his love for you. We apply the gospel when we remind ourselves of his love and we enter into a relationship that Jesus has made possible for us. Because of the gospel, we show we enjoy intimacy with God himself. 
Shortly after the Korean War, a Korean woman had an affair with an American soldier, and she became pregnant. He went back to the U.S. She never saw him again. She gave birth to the little girl that looked different from all the other Korean girls that were around her. She was light-colored, had curly hair. And in that culture, children of mixed races were ostracized by the community. In fact, many women would kill their children because they didn't want to face such rejection in their community. But this young woman didn't do that. She tried to raise her little girl as best as she could until the rejection was just too much. She did something that probably nobody in this room could imagine ever doing. She abandoned her little girl in the streets. And the little girl was ruthlessly taunted by people everywhere. They called her the ugliest of words in the Korean language. And it didn't take long for the little girl to draw conclusions about herself based on the way that other people treated her. For two years, she lived on the streets until finally she made her way to an orphanage. And one day, a came, word came that a couple from America was coming to adopt a little boy. And every child in that orphanage got excited because at least one boy there was going to have hope. He was going to have a family. And so this little girl spent the day cleaning up the little boys, giving them baths and combing their hair and wondering which one would be adopted by this American couple. And the next day, the couple came and this is what the girl recalled in her own words. She said, it was like Goliath had come back to life. I saw this man with huge hands lift every single baby. He knew, I knew that he loved every single one of them as if they were his own. I saw tears running down his face. And I knew if they could, they would have taken every one of these babies home with them. And then out of the corner of his eyes, he saw me. Now let me tell you, I was nine years old. I didn't even weigh 30 pounds. I was a scrawny thing. I had worms in my body. I had lice in my hair. I had boils all over me. I was full of scars. I wasn't a pretty sight. But the man came over to me, and he began rattling away in English, and I looked up at him. And then he took his huge hand, and he touched my face. What was he saying? He was saying, I want this child. This is the child for me. And from that day forward, he became my father. Brothers, sisters, we are that child. We are full of dirt and a mess because of the sins we've committed. And yet Jesus comes to us and says, I want you. You are loved because of Jesus. If you are here this evening, this morning, and you feel like no one loves you, can I remind you, read Romans 8, Jesus says he loves you. You belong to him. Even if everyone else rejects you, you are his, you are loved. Remind yourself daily, God loves you. Number three, you've been given the power to change. You've been given the power to change. A few months ago, I had this crazy idea of trying to get in shape and decided to go running for a while. And we ran out, me and my son ran out the house and ran to um, the neighborhood park. And about 40 minutes into it, realized that we had no energy to get back. Um, and so we sat at the park bench and waited for my wife to come and get me. Um, being honest, um, that's not my calling to be in shape. Live, you die, go to heaven and see Jesus, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, I have no power to change myself, just being honest. The story of the Bible is the story of our inability to obey God. We can't. The good I want to do, I don't do. The bad I do, don't want to do, I end up doing, right? Romans 7. Without Jesus, none of us in this room would ever be able to please God. Without Jesus, none of us would ever, we might do a few moral things, but we would never live lives that bring glory and honor to God. But when we believe in Jesus, God, Ezekiel says, God gives us a new heart so that we would want to obey him. 
When we understand the truth of the gospel and God begins to change us, he rewires us so that we don't just act differently, but we desire differently. We begin to love the things that God loves, and he gives us new desires, Scripture says. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that, he could, so that we could empower our obedience. When we follow Jesus, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead begins to work in us. He begins to develop new characteristics in us. Things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. God, and not only that, but God, God guarantees that he who began a good work in you, he'll be faithful to complete it. That he is going to finish what he starts. Of course, you and I play a role in that. In his letter to the church in Philippi, Paul encourages the church to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. But even that is a product of God's work within us. In the very next verse, Paul says, it is God who works in us so that we desire to act in new ways. In fact, our role involves discipline, involves hard work, but even our role is powered by God. Our hard work is necessary, but it's only possible because God is empowering us to do that very work. Listen, when we follow Jesus, none of us operate on our own power. God starts to work in us and gives us the power that we've never had before. He's renovating us from the inside out. When we struggle to change, remind ourselves that God has given us a new heart. He's also given us the Holy Spirit to change and empower us. He gives us the power to change, and he always finishes what he starts. Some of you this morning are struggling because you're, you're discouraged because you're struggling in sin. Can I encourage you to keep pushing into Jesus? Keep pushing into Jesus because the Jesus who saved you is faithful to transform you into the very likeness of Jesus. He will not fail. He will not give up on you. Keep pushing in. Number four, you're part of a new family. You're part of a new family. Churches don't often look like much. I'm not talking about buildings. I'm talking about people. It seems they're full of people like us. People that are imperfect, inconvenient, sometimes disappointing, and it's always a lot of work. But they're also beautiful. Churches display the glory and the wisdom of God. At the very best, they are a foretaste of what heaven is supposed to look like. They're where we go, where we're loved, where we love. They're where we learn to be part of God's family. One of God's greatest gifts that he gives us through the gospel is the opportunity to be part of his family so you and I, we don't have to live alone. This past Sunday, while each of you were here worshiping, several of us were in Honduras. We were in a church with people that we had never met before, in a foreign country, and they were singing and speaking in a language that I didn't know at all. And yet when we stood and we began to sing, and we kept singing, and we kept singing. They had one song that went on for about 25 minutes, and they just kept clapping, and they just kept singing and singing, even though I didn't know any of their names, and even though I didn't speak their language, and even though I didn't know any of them, I knew that I belonged there because they were part of the family of God. And as I looked around and I saw the people worshiping, some with tears in their eyes, some with all their energy that they had, I was reminded that even if, God forbid, I'm never able to go back to Honduras again, I knew that that wasn't the last time I would see them. That because Jesus had poured out his love on them, and because Jesus has poured out his love on me, one day we will stand together and worship Jesus together. Those of us who are part, who are in Christ, are part of a big family. We're never alone. There are people of God in every corner of this earth, and they're our family. What's true globally is also true locally. When we started as a church several years ago, we didn't have many people in my, our church. But I'm glad we do now. As the church grew, so did my family. Lost City Church has names, has faces. 
We laugh together. We pray together. We learn from one another. It's not perfect. We annoy each other, but that's okay. I love knowing that I'm not alone and that I have people that are watching out for me just as I'm watching out for them. For some of us, we have nothing in common other than the fact that Jesus loved us. We don't like the same hobbies. We don't like the same sports. We can't keep a conversation going. But we're family. We come from different backgrounds. We come from all over this country. We come from all over the world. Some of us were blessed to be raised in homes where our parents were followers of Jesus. Others of us in this room encountered Jesus very recently, and all of this faith stuff is brand new to you. Some of you have been blessed with education and jobs where you don't have to worry about a lot of needs in your life. Some of you have been put in places where you need to trust that God will provide even your daily meal for today. Some of you tend to lean right on political issues. Others of you tend to lean left on political issues. Some of you are single. Some of you are married. Some of you have children. Some of you in this room have been blessed with grandchildren. Some of you are in school. Some of you are working. For quite a number of you, Dallas isn't going to be the last place that you will live. You're here for a season, and then you will go where God takes you next. But regardless of whether you grow old here or end up somewhere else, listen, you will always be family. You will always be family. When you look around, I pray that you don't see an Indian man on stage or a white woman or an um, Asian girl. I pray that you don't see a rich couple or a poor kid. I pray that you would see family. I pray that when you look around this room that you would care for one another as you would your own children or your own siblings or your own parents. Because brothers, sisters, we're family. Family isn't merely a metaphor for us. We are brothers and sisters because of the gospel. But listen, that has some implications. It means that you have to take your spiritual family seriously. When we understand the local church is a family of brothers and sisters, we make it a priority in our lives. You don't just settle for attending worship services when it's convenient, nor can you approach church with a consumer mindset. You dig into the messiness of the local church life, opening up your life to a new spiritual family. Listen, families are messy and they're costly, but they're worth it. When we live our lives like we're spiritually brothers and sisters, it changes everything. Family is one of the greatest blessings of the gospel. You're never alone. You have family everywhere. We can love and be loved and display God's glory because we're never alone. Two more, three more. Number five, you can have hope when you suffer. You can have hope when you suffer. You know, doing ministry for a while, I've learned to avoid giving an easy answers when other people are suffering. It's usually much better to just simply offer friendship, silent companionship, and practical help rather than words. And as I've walked through hard times myself and alongside others, I discovered three truths that have been of great comfort. Number one, it's okay to grieve. I'm grateful that the Bible gives us permission to grieve. In fact, the book of Psalms is full of more of songs of lament than any other kind of psalm there is. There's a time to weep both for ourselves and with others who are going through difficult times. Secondly, we're invited to pray. My prayers in the middle of suffering aren't articulate, and yet that's okay. As Paul explains in his letter to the Romans, for we don't know what to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. God knows what we're saying even when we lack words, and more importantly, he cares. He cares. And finally, I found it important, helpful to remember that God is working even through our suffering. I don't say that lightly, nor do I always understand it, but it's true. And that won't ease the pain that you and I go through, but it allows us to rest in the fact that God hasn't lost control. He promises to work everything out for good to those 
in his in the those he works promises to work everything together for good in this life. And in Revelation, he promises to wipe every tear from our eye, and that will eliminate death and mourning and fear. Listen, you and I, we don't always understand what God is doing. So Romans 11 says, how unsearchable are his judgments, how in, inscrutable his ways. The gospel doesn't give us answers, but it gives us assurance that God does not abandon us. He does not forsake us. These truths don't eliminate our tears or shortcut our grief, but they provide immeasurable comfort. God is so committed to us in Jesus that he promises and uses even those hard things that we go through in our, for our intense, for our ultimate good, even if we can't see it right now. Number six, you know your life has meaning. You know your life has meaning because of the gospel. The gospel is what gives our souls, is what gives us what our souls crave, a deep sense of value and identity. Through the gospel, we become God's own children, his precious possession, his royal priesthood. We've, given, we've been given important tasks that matter for eternity to make disciples and to use our gifts so that we can serve others. You know, I often feel insignificant. And when I focus on the fact that I am one of 7.6 billion people alive on this huge planet in a vast universe, it doesn't matter how hard I work or what I leave behind, I will be forgotten. A hundred years from now, no one will remember that I was alive. And yet God says, I'll never forget you. I'll never forget you. I have been adopted by him, our passage said. Scripture tells us no matter, that tells us that we matter and that we work, that our work for him will never be wasted. We've been given an identity that cannot be taken away and our actions matter, our lives matter, not just for now, but for eternity. We have everything we need to live lives of significance. Last one, we have an incredible example to follow. We have an example to follow. We often learn best by example. The problem with examples is that they often discourage us more than encourage us. LeBron James doesn't encourage me to be a better basketball player, just being honest. He encourages me to give up because no matter how hard I try, I will never be LeBron James, right? One, God for some reason decided not to make me tall enough to be able to get past Sean over here in a basketball court. I'm not good enough. He's not a good example for me. If we're not careful, the example of Jesus might dishearten us because we feel like we'll never measure up to Jesus. But when you and I are gripped by the fact of what Jesus did for us, his example should motivate you. His example should empower you. A few years ago, I had a hard time forgiving someone for something that they did to me. It was difficult. And I thought I would never forgive them because they were incredibly mean to them. And yet a few, uh, a few weeks ago at a wedding, I saw them. And I realized that God had softened my heart to them. You know how? Because as I soak in the gospel, as I remember how much Jesus forgave me when I didn't deserve it. It allows me to be able to extend forgiveness to others. It didn't happen instantly. It wasn't easy, but it happened. The gospel serves as an example and a motivation at the same time. Jesus provides an example for us in so many areas. The Bible uses Jesus' actions as a pattern for us, and it gives us the power to follow this pattern, which you and I, we can't do on our own. We may not be generous until we consider how generous Jesus has been to us. Men, you may not love your wives, but until you learn the way that Jesus treasures the church, his bride. When we're mistreated, we can remember that Jesus was mistreated for us. When we see what Jesus did for us, it motivates us to follow his example. So why does knowing all of this and believing all of this matter? Because the gospel doesn't just bring us into right relationship with God and assure us of our future with him. 
but it also provides rich resources for dealing with every aspect of our lives. See, when you soak in the gospel, it changes your marriages. It changes your lives. It changes your work lives. It changes your relationships. It changes your habits. It changes your bodies, your emotions, and so much more. It has the power to change every part of your lives from the inside out. There's nothing that the gospel leaves alone. And that's my prayer as we go through this series, that each of us would allow the gospel to so transform our lives that it would produce better marriages. It would create healthy relationships, wise decisions, healthy emotions, that it would empower you to overcome sins that will ultimately destroy your lives, that it would encourage you in the moments where the enemy puts lies into your head to say no. No, I belong to Jesus. You got to stop. It will enable you to be the husband or the wife or the parent that God desires for you, that it will offer you grace in the moments that you mess up to be reminded that God isn't done with you yet. The gospel isn't just good news that will get us to heaven. It's not even just a set of resources or benefits that we get to enjoy. It is God himself who is in relationship with us, who is transforming us, and who gives us everything that we need so that we can become like him. There's an old hymn that says, How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord. And the hymn asks this question, What more can he say to you than he had already said? who unto the Savior for refuge have fled. What more can God give to you than he's already given? What more can he say to you than he's already said? Listen, friends, God hasn't held back on you. He has lavished you with benefits of the gospel that you can apply to your lives. The Bible assures us that change is possible as we enjoy intimacy with God that is for us through the gospel. And as we live off of its benefits, we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds. God has given us untold riches. He prayed to the Ephesian church that they would have the eyes of your hearts would be enlightened that you may know what is the hope to what you have been called to. What are the riches of the glorious inheritance of the saints? That should be our prayer as well, that we grow in the knowledge of the riches that we have in the gospel, that we begin to live in the knowledge that all of these riches are ours forever. Are you fighting shame or feeling guilty? Don't believe the lies. God silences your accuser, and he's clothed you with the righteousness of Jesus. The final verdict has been spoken over your life, and listen, nothing can change that. Are you criticized or justly, or criticized justly or unjustly? Worst things can be said about all of us. And God knows the worst about you. And yet he has chosen to pardon you and love you. And the court has been adjourned. Are you disappointed by the actions of others and often feeling lonely? You couldn't be more loved than you are in Jesus. You have the love of the Father. He exalts over you. He sings over you. He dances over you. Are you frustrated by the lack of progress in your life? Are you struggling with negative or damaging patterns of behavior? Listen, friends, God is at work in your life. He promises you that he will give you power. He's changing you from the inside out. And listen, he always finishes what he starts. Are you tired of trying to make it on your own? He's given you a family, and that family is everywhere. He invites you to be a part of his family so that you can display his glory and to love and be loved. Are you going through hard times? Listen, God knows. God cares. He invites you to grieve, to pray, and trust that he is at work even when it's hard. He will one day wipe the tears from your eyes, and he will destroy those things that are trying to destroy you. Are you looking for purpose? Listen, God gives you a new identity, a new meaning, and a new responsibility. Your life matters because of Jesus. You are now called to faithfully use everything that he's given you, your time, your body, and more for his glory. Do you need motivation? The blessing of the gospel motivates you to live your life of worship, gratitude, and service. 
You've been given an example to follow. Feeling insecure? The gospel starts to motivate you to stop looking at yourself and instead start looking to Jesus. To begin to put others in front of yourself, to give us the freedom to forget, to freedom of self-forgetfulness, you'll get, you'll get to what you must do soon enough. But it gives you freedom. Over the course of this series, we're beginning to talk about habits that we need to build things that we need to do so that we can grow in our faith. And we'll get to all of that soon enough. But we begin by knowing the good news of what Jesus has already done for us. I started this sermon with the story of Lola, a woman who grew up in slavery. In some ways, Lola's not like us. Lola did nothing to deserve her slavery. She was a victim. And yet, we're culpable in our own slavery. We rebelled against God, and yet we're like Lola in one way. We have a hard time accepting our freedom. Once Alex invited Lola to live with him, she continued in her old behaviors. She never threw anything out. She rifled through the trash to make sure others hadn't thrown away anything useful. She washed and reused paper towels. She kept grocery bags and yogurt containers and pickle jars she was free, and she had everything that she needed. And she continued to live like a poor slave. What about us? What about us? God has given us everything that we needed. He has given us more than we can ask or think. We've been set free. And yet we don't live like the resources of the gospel have given us. Our greatest problem isn't that we lack freedom. We've been offered that. And we've been offered unimaginable wealth through the gospel. Our problem is that we have a hard time living as if it's true. I pray that our hearts would be enlightened to the hope to which we have been called, the glorious inheritance of the saints, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the power of his might. In other words, we have to accept what's true, and then we have to live like it's true.